Moreover, his private life was infamous, and no man who cared for honour or purity would abide at his court. End quote. Now, that's Charles Oman uh, writing in the very, very early 20th century, um, being sort of uh, polite there. What he really means by saying that his private life was infamous was that he was um, musical, gay, queer, uh, homosexual, um, which openly as well, which also you can only imagine at, in the 11th century was well frowned upon, should we say, at the very least. Um, but he didn't, he didn't seem to care. He's quite a crazy character, really, William Rufus. He's one of those people who just says what he likes and likes what he bloody well says. He does whatever he wants. I was going to say within reason, but not even within reason. He does whatever he wants, does and says whatever he wants at all times. And if anyone tries to stop him or, 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 or raises an eyebrow, he'll do away with you. Not necessarily murder you on the spot or anything, but, you know, no one's going to stop him from doing anything he wants to do. And if that's, you know, being irreligious, being openly homosexual, um, and, and also there, Oman says that no, uh, what's the line? Um, yeah, and also he says that no man who cared for honour or purity would abide at his court. So that, again, is a very nice way, very sort of, guarded way of saying that licentiousness abounded at William Rufus's court. In other words, all sorts of crazy sex stuff might have gone on at his court. You know, again, in the 11th century, that's not usual at all. Um, we haven't got fantastic details, but a lot of the sources, well, the original sources, like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or someone like Ulrich Vitalis or... Robert of Jumiège or someone, they'll, they'll couch it in sort of fairly nice language, but you can only sort of infer that there might have been crazy, crazy parties and stuff. Uh, again, we don't really have a lot of the detail, but we do know that he never took a wife. He never sired any children, William Rufus. Um, he's that type of homosexual that doesn't like women at all. He's not sort of camp. He's not like feminine and have loads of girlfriends. No, he was a type of homosexual who didn't really want to be around women at all. He genuinely loved men, strong, big men. <laughs> he was that type. So, um, um, again, it's just, it's, just, it's just a funny, interesting character. Um, uh, he's sort of an odd one out for centuries before and after. There's no one like him. He's very uh, flamboyant. Um, yeah, you can't accuse him of being... Uh, uninteresting, at least. Um, um, allow me to read on from uh, Sir Charles Oman. He said, quote, Nevertheless, despite all these shortcomings, uh, nevertheless, his government was far more tolerable than the anarchy of baronial rule would have been, i.e. better that than just a mad free-for-all civil war type situation. And, you know, he's not wrong. Um if he sheared his subjects close himself, he took care that no one else should molest them, and one bad master is always better than many. Maybe. Um, under him, England was cruelly taxed, and many isolated acts of oppression were committed. Uh, but he put down civil war, overcame his foreign enemies, and ruled victoriously for all his days. So again, a strong, strong hand on the tiller there, no doubt about that. Of William, of William II's exploits, those which were the most profitable uh, for the peace of England were his enterprises against the Scots and the Welsh. Malcolm Canmore, the King of Scotland, uh, though he had done homage to William I, repeatedly led armies into England against William's sons. Uh, in his first Scottish war, the Red King... Uh, though his fleet was destroyed by a storm, compelled Malcolm to submit and took from him the city of Carlisle and the district of Cumberland. So the Scots are controlling Cumberland at that point. So, you know, that's interesting to bear in mind, isn't it? But, you know, Rufus Red takes it off him. This land, 
the southern half, uh, uh, this land, the southern half of the old Welsh principality of Strathclyde, had been tributary to the Scots ever since. Uh, uh, ever since King Edmund granted it to Malcolm I in nine forty five. He now became an English county and bishopric, and the border of England was fixed at the Solway and was no longer at the hills of the Lake District. And this is in 10, 1092. Um, only a year later, the Scottish king again invaded England, but was slain at Alnwick. He ran into an ambush, uh, which the Earl of Northumberland laid for him and fell. Uh, with him died his son Edward, and the best of his knights. The Scottish crown passed, after much fighting and contention, to Aidgar, Malcolm's son, Malcolm, sorry, Malcolm's second son, by his English wife, Margaret, the sister of Edgar the Aetheling. There you see. Um, this prince, uh, trained up by his pious and able mother, was aided and counselled uh, by his uncle, the Aetheling, uh, was the first king of Scotland who spoke English as his native tongue and made the lowlands his favourite ab abode. Uh, he surrounded himself with English followers and ceased to be a mere Celtic lord of the highlands as his father's, as his father's had been. Um, so I'll get into that. We'll, we'll get into all that in much, much more detail in a later epochs when we sort of concentrate more on Scottish things. Um, but that is interesting to bear in mind there that the the... Scottish royal family, royal line, um, is now sort of, you know, irretrievably entwined with England at that point. They're not just out and out full, full Scottish Highlanders. As I say, they've married into the English line. Yeah, Margaret. So we'll bear that in mind. Quick word then. On uh, Wales and the Welsh marches, Oman goes on, quote, William the Red's arms were as successful against Wales as against Scotland. During his reign, the southern half of the land of the Kimru uh, was overrun by Norman barons who won for themselves new lordships beyond the Wye and Severn uh, and did homage for them to the king. Many of these adventurers married into the families of the South Welsh princes and became the inheritors of their local power. In North Wales, the Normans pushed across the Dee and built great castles at Rudlin and Flint and Montgomery, but they could not, uh, but they could not win the mountainous districts about Snowdon, where the native chiefs still maintained a precarious independence. There you go. So it's not until many, many uh, generations later before the Welsh are, even the North Wales are, you know, thoroughly subdued. Um, you know, Henry II does a, does a number on them, and it's not until Edward I, Longshanks, um, the one in the Braveheart film, where he really stomps a mud hole. He opens up a can of whoop ass on the Welsh. <laughs> Let me continue, because there's a bit to get through here, and we're getting on in time a bit. Uh, Oman goes on. Uh, beyond the British seas, William waged constant war with his brother Robert and always had the better of his elder, for the Duke, though a brave soldier, was a very incapable ruler and lost by his shiftless negligence all that he had gained by his sword. There you go, shiftless negligence. Sort of puts it in a nutshell, doesn't it? Um, he, um, Curtoes, he was forced in 1091 to cede several of his towns to William and to promise to make him his heir if he should die without male issue, which he didn't. Um, but in 1096, the king gained possession of the whole and not a mere faction of the Norman duchy. For Robert, seized with a sudden uh, access of piety and a spirit of wandering and unrest, a vow to go off to the First Crusade, uh, which was then being preached. In order to get the money to fit out a large army, he unwisely mortgaged the whole of his lands to his gr grasping brother for the very moderate sum of £6,666. Uh, who was it earlier? Churchill. One of the other historians said it was 10,000 marks. I must admit, I don't really know exactly what it meant by marks and pounds in this time. It's difficult. It's always difficult with uh, money isn't it, when you're talking about things hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years ago. Or when you try and calculate what a million sesterces in Rome might have really meant in our terms, it's difficult to do. But anyway, 
it's a large sum of money. £6,666 in the late 11th century is obviously a, a huge amount of money. Nevertheless, he's buying the whole of Normandy for it. So in one sense, maybe it's cheap. Maybe it's a, a, a great deal. It might be worth, well be worth much more than that even. But nonetheless, Omar goes on. So William ruled Normandy, William II, ruled Normandy for a space, and Robert went off with half the baronage of Western Christendom to deliver the Holy Sepulchre from the Turks and to set up a Christian kingdom in Palestine. Among, among his companions were the Aethelin Edgar and many Englishmen more. The Duke fought so gallantly against the infidel that the Crusaders offered him the crown of Jerusalem, but he would have none of it and set his face homeward after four years of absence. That is in 1099. He goes back pretty much straight away. Um, let me just read on. King William, meanwhile, had been ruling both England and Normandy with a higher hand. He and his favourite minister, Ralph Flambard, I've heard it sometimes, Ranulph Flambard, um, uh, uh, Ralph Flambard, uh, had been devising all manner of new ways for raising money, when a tenant of the crown died, they would not let his son or heir succeed to his estate till he had paid an extortionate fine to the king. When a bishop or an abbot died, they kept his place empty for months or even for years and confiscated all the revenues of the see or abbey during the vacancy. That's cheeky, isn't it? That's, that's, that's out of order, really. Anyone can see that's just theft, isn't it? Um, it was on this question that there broke out the celebrated quarrel between William the Red and Archbishop Anselm. I'll just pause there for a sec, because the Archbishop for a long time had been Lanfranc, or Longfranc. He'd been uh, Archbishop of Canterbury for a long time, uh, all the way through most of William the Conqueror's reign. But he'd finally died, and the, the, the next one was the second, sort of second in command at the, already, and Anselm, Anselm of Beck. And... Anselm of Beck is important for the story because he lives for quite a long time. He outlives Rufus. He becomes Archbishop. He stays as Archbishop through Henry I's reign, the next king. Um, and so he becomes an important person, Anselm of Beck. And he's quite important anyway. He's, um, he's thought of as a, a theologian. Um, the things he thought and said were sort of very important at the time. He wasn't just another Archbishop of Canterbury, just a name on a list. He's actually a you know, a person in history in his own right, <laughs> without being too glib. Um, you know, he is, uh, he is important. And his, his time as Archbishop of Canterbury is just, again, heavily wound up with Rufus and the, the two people. Well, I'm sure Omar goes on to talk about exactly that. Um, yeah, okay. When, uh, again, this is Omar, quote, uh, when Lanfranc, his father's wise counsellor, died in 1089, the king left the see of Canterbury unfulfilled for nearly four years and embezzled its revenues. Um, but being stricken with illness in 1093, which he recovered from, but being stricken with illness, he had a moment of compunction and filled up the archbishopric by appointing Anselm, abbot of Beck. And Anselm, uh, like his predecessor Lanfranc, was a learned and pious Italian monk who had governed his Norman Abbey so well that he won the respect of all his neighbours. He was only persuaded with difficulty to accept the position of head of the English church, because it's a bit of a poison chalice. It's a difficult role, really. And here's a quote, supposedly a quote from Anselm of Beck himself. He's supposed to have said, Will you couple me, a poor weak old sheep, to that fierce young bull, the King of England? He asked when the bishops came to offer him the primacy. <laughs> but, they, but they forced the pastoral staff into his hands and hurried him off to be installed. When William recovered from his sickness, he began to ask large sums of money from Anselm in return for the price of preferment that he had been that he had received. In other, in other words, he said, "You know, I've made you, I've promoted you massively to be Archbishop of Canterbury. You know, one of the most powerful men in England, in Western Europe. You know, you know, give me some money. I need money. Um, come on, this doesn't come for free." Um, uh, okay, the king called this exacting. Uh, sorry, the king called this exacting his his feudal dues, but the archbishop called it simony, the ancient crime of Simon Magus, who offered gold to the apostles to buy spiritual privileges. Simony is a really bad crime, 
uh, well, it's a pretty bad crime anyway, but in the 11th century, it's a really bad crime. It's, you know, it's, it's up there with murder and rape and all sorts of things. It's sort of one of the worst things you can do, you know, simony. Um, and William Rufus is sort of undeniably guilty of it. Um, okay, so we're told that Anselm of Beck, he, Anselm of Beck, sent £500, uh, but when the king asked for more, utterly refused to comply. I've told you, haven't I, that you don't cross William Rufus at all. You do what you're told, otherwise there's going to be trouble. Oh. So, uh, but Anselm of Beck, quote, utterly refused to comply. From this time forth, there was constant strife between R William and Anselm. Uh, uh, the first beginning of that intermittent war between the crown and the church, which was to last for more than two centuries. And we'll get into Henry II and um, his troubles uh, with troublesome archbishops. <laughs> the archbishop was always withstanding the king. Brave, he is brave. Uh, um, when two popes disputed the tiara of Rome, i.e. Being, being, being pope, <laughs> uh, William refused to acknowledge either, but Anselm would not allow that, uh, would not allow that there was any doubt did homage to Urban, one of the popes, and thus forced the king's hand by committing England to one side in the dispute. Uh, when Urban sent over to Anselm the pall, which is a type of, we're told, it's a, well, we're told, it's a narrow tippet of, of white wool fastened by four black cross-headed pins, such as we see in the shield and arms of the Sea of Canterbury. So anyway, a, a, a trinket, a physical thing, artifact was sent to Canterbury by Rome, by the Pope in Rome. Um, and we told it was, it was the sign of his metropolitan jurisdiction over the island. The king wished to deliver it to the archbishop with his own hands, but Anselm vowed that this was receiving spiritual things from a secular master and would not take it save with his own hands and from the high altar of Canterbury Cathedral. You know, that sort of thing would just annoy Rufus. That's just annoying to him. You know, who do you think you are? You're just my archbishop. I, I, can, I hired you, I can fire you sort of thing. Just know your role. Uh, but Anselm wouldn't really play ball exactly. Um, <clears throat> Nor did he, Anselm, cease denouncing the ill living of the king and his courtiers. You know what I'm talking about. Um, till, William grew, till William grew so wroth uh, that he would have slain him had not all England revered the fearless archbishop as a saint. At last he found a way of molesting Anselm under form of law. He declared that the lands of the Sea of Canterbury had not sent an adequate feudal contingent to his Welsh wars and imposed enormous fines on the archbishop for a breach of his duties as a tenant-in-chief of the crown. Soon afterwards, Anselm left the realm, abandoning the king to his own devices uh, as incorrigible and took his way to Pope Urban at Rome. Nor did he return till William was dead. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.